Oh my. Okay, how have you been? Fine. Good to meet you. It's yeah, we have a wonderful spring morning once again. You know, yeah. the bad thing about the situation now is that the weather has been perfect for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> it's been the same here too. It's been like uh, I don't know, maybe like twenty two, twenty three degrees, and really sunny. So like really just pleasant to be outside. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really nice. Well, thank you for coming on today. Ah, pleasure. Something I was hoping for ages. <laughs> You know, about two years ago, I came across a video on YouTube about a guy <laughs> with hands-free equalization. I thought, well, that okay. sounds quite interesting. <laughs> and cool. yesterday I checked and I saw that your video had 106,000 views. That's totally amazing. <laughs> Lots of people want to learn hands-free. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's um, it's like one of the topics that always come up in free diving courses. You know, how do you do the equalization right. with using health? Is Frenzel? No, then yeah. no, it's not Frenzel. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm really glad you're on the show today, and um, I'm happy that some people are able to join even at that early hour in Europe. <laughs> so, well, you you I imagine you record it and yeah. put it up somewhere later. Yeah, yeah, cool. Right. Cool. Yeah, it would be a pity. <laughs> Yeah, so hands-free equalization, that's that's like when somebody talks about hands-free equalization, they think about you. That's totally oh. connected. <laughs> oh, fantastic. I mean, I didn't really know what the extent of it was. Do you know what I mean? Because like, you know, you, you make videos and you put them on YouTube and that's it. They're out there in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, you're never really certain what kind of an impact they have. Obviously, there's you see how many people have watched it. But mm -hmm. YouTube is a weird thing where you get – all kinds of random people watching random videos for no reason at all. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so how did you get into hands-free equalization? I mean, is that something that came naturally to you or is it something no. you had to work hard on? I, I, wor I worked quite hard for it. So um, uh, so what, what happened, me, me and hands-free equalization? Oh, just so, are we, uh, is this, have we begun now? We've begun the... Yeah. Well, we did. Oh, cool. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, okay. <laughs> so uh, I began, uh, okay, so I started free diving in Koh Tao uh, at uh, the Apnea Total School there. Mm -hmm. And when, when I went there, they had this, uh, I do like a master course. So you stay there for like, you know, four or six weeks. You just, you just dive every day. And as part of that, you know, they gave you this piece of paper that said how to learn hands-free equalization. And mm -hmm. what I've realized is that it's like a, a very like an old, it's a translation from like an old French uh, manuscript. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and like they basically said, okay, there's a bunch of really weird exercises. Uh, do them every day and you'll be able to hands free. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, well, I really want to be able to hands free because I just, I just thought it was so, I don't know, like, you know, you, 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 the idea I had in my head of free diving um, and then obviously having to pinch my nose everywhere I went didn't link up with the, that, that freedom feeling I wanted. Um, so, so I went through the exercises every day mm -hmm. and I was really diligent with it. Um, and some of the exercises were looking back, some of the exercises were, were, you know, quite good and some of them were missing the mark. Um, and in the end, uh, what, what I did was I remember every day I, I would go swimming breaststroke and every time I'd go under, I'd go under like quite deep. And as, I, as I'd go under like half a meter or so, mm -hmm. um, I would try to hands free and then come up and then try to hands free and then come up. And, and you know, if you're doing that like hundreds of times every day, um, there's many opportunities to, <laughs> to work with it. And then eventually it worked. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh my God, I can hands free. And then I couldn't really do it on dives, but I could do it a little bit. And then over the years, it just sort of got stronger and I got more control. And then, you know, then I was doing it, uh, you know, to my deepest depths. And, uh, and then here we are. Mm hmm. Cool. Yeah, that's really yeah. amazing. So another question would be, at uh, until what depths can you do it? But from what you say, I take it that it's, yeah, there's that, no limit. That's right. There, no, there's no limit on, on hands-free equalization. It, it goes... Uh, I mean, you, you can do pure hands free to an unlimited depth or, mm -hmm. uh, it can go hand in hand with a frenzel or, or mouth fill equalization. So, uh, you know, I think that, um, often for, for most deep divers who can hands free, their hands free is very much a supplementary equalization technique, which, which, you know, supplements their, their mouth fill or improves their mouth fill skill or their frenzel mm -hmm. skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's or, and, and, and it makes them look very cool. That's right. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Much more relaxed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Evilization is like the number one topic in free diving. Some people they get totally. 10 meters and some they get them at 30 meters, but they all totally. struggle. So what do you recommend our viewers how to get into hands-free equalization? What to look for? How does it work? You know? Those, so like, I, I have a whiteboard behind me. That's great. I'm gonna. <laughs> I can. I'll get off the screen so people. I I, I can zo I can just carry it over. <laughs> like, I'm just using my phone. So um, I'll show you what I'm gonna do is I'll I'll draw the uh, the little picture. You know the little equalizing person picture that we all draw. Mm. And uh, I'll show you exactly what's going on. It's very very simple. So uh, I'm I'm in my destroyed garage slash studio. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'm going to draw my little picture. So here is uh, here's a cross section of the oral and nasal cavity. This is the soft and hard palate. This is the nasal cavity going back down. Here's my tongue uh, going down. Here is my vocal cords, my vocal fold, or the glottis, whatever we want to call it. Doesn't really matter. Um, here's my weak chin. Uh, no, well, let's pretend like I have a big, strong, powerful chin, like a um. Like a what's that that uh, the the ha Habsburg, <laughs> like a Habsburg. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, my eyes la da back and and there's there's you know the the sort of the, the cross section of the oral and nasal cavity. So um, the opening to the eustachian tube is uh, right here on the back of the nasal cavity, right? So we just draw like a little eustachian tube here, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and here's our middle ear. Um, now, what happens is we have a, like a muscle here in the back of our soft palate, and when we position it in a certain way, we pull down on the underside of the eustachian tube on its own, and it opens up. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be, there's always going to be, now to, obviously this, this is a, depending on, on how we use this, but there's always going to be a pressure difference, right? There's always going to be like, uh, especially if, if we haven't equalized, there'll most likely be a lower air pressure in the mm -hmm. ear, and the second that we open that up, the air will be pulled in. Mm -hmm. Or that's that's one sort of way to view it, or one way to do it. Or I, I find that that especially beginners have have, uh, uh, which is why I always teach it this way. That beginners have a they have um, like a high success rate if at the same time as opening, they also lift up their their larynx mm -hmm. and like do like a like a like a partial frenzel equalization, or just like you know just the bottom part mm -hmm. to shift a little bit of air in there. So that they're not relying purely on perfect timing to make sure they they have the pressure correctly. They can just always shift air up into the ear. But, but that's as simple as this. It's it's as simple as positioning the soft palate kind of like this. So it sticks up a little bit there and dips down like that. Positioning the soft palate just like that, mm -hmm. which opens up the eustachian tube. And for an added little bonus, just move some airflow up into the nasal cavity. Uh, mm -hmm. And and that's and that's that's really the simplicity of no hands. The tricky part is the muscle isolation. Mm -hmm. So um, in order to, to, to be able to no hands equalize, we have to effectively or do the same thing as like, you know, learning to raise an eyebrow, right? Mm -hmm. You have to, <laughs> you have to move your soft palate in this position, this, this ideal position, mm -hmm. which is all well and good, except that you usually can't see what your soft palate's doing. <laughs> so you can't stand in front of the mirror and like work with your eyebrow uh, or, you know, wiggle, like how people can wiggle there. You know, I'm trying to, all the different muscle isolations. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it, it's something that usually takes a little bit more time mm -hmm. uh, because, because we can't watch the progress along. We tend to have to play around with it a little bit, but there are some techniques that we can use to, to find it faster, which we'll go into shortly. Now, the other thing is that because we, we use our oral muscles pretty much predominantly for breathing, uh, eating, and speaking, is that we have a lot of paired muscle movements. Mm -hmm. um, like, so just, I mean, just a brief example. Uh, one, one of, one of the, the really like simple explanations for people who are like, oh, you know, I'm trying to learn how to frenzel, but every time I frenzel, I can't stop contracting my abdominals. Mm -hmm. And the answer is, well, when in your life, did you use your oral muscles or did you use your speaking muscles or muscles that you would use in the way to speak, especially when we start saying do T, 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 K, 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 and their speech part of the brain activates. When do you use those muscles without exhaling? Which is the answer, which is pretty much never. Yeah. So we have, we have so many paired movements between mm -hmm. our respiratory muscles and our oral muscles, and we move them all together. Mm -hmm. And so we need to also, um, on top of learning how to isolate 
the the soft palate, the muscles in the soft palate. Um, I think it's also important to isolate the movements of the larynx and isolate the movements of the tongue, because if we can do that, then as we're learning to do this, we are we are problem solving for ourselves as opposed mm-hmm. to being like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, and you're moving everything. Mm-hmm. You know, if if we can control things individually, then we can focus on on the right thing. Right. Yeah. So when I when I teach someone how to 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 begin the journey for no hands equalization, and you know the, you know some people you know you sit down in the classroom with them and you go through a no hands workshop, and by the end of the workshop in a few hours they can do it, they can no hands equalize. Some people it'll take them a week or two of of going through drills, and some people will take them a month or two. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just uh, it depends it depends on how much control you have of your mouth and <laughs> and and also like you know how well you take to this specific kind of random movement that is arbitrary that we don't use for really anything else in life you know Mm -hmm. so um but so i I usually i'll start with a bunch of drills which are uh the drills are larynx control drills Mm -hmm. so the it's it's all about controlling the movement of the larynx up and down and be having that movement be independent of the tongue Mm -hmm. because we often use once again our larynx in conjunction with that with our tongue muscles um and even some of the nerves, some of the nerves that control uh, the larynx are, are synonymous with controlling the base of the tongue. So there's a link there as well mm-hmm. uh, in that in that sense. So um, uh, so I do uh, I get people to, to start uh, and, and we can we can start to build a little a little no hands equalization program now as we as we as we chat. Yeah, that would you know, be. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I get I get people to do uh, ten larynx. Pumps. I call them a pump, which is like a larynx lift as high as you can go and a larynx drop as far as it will go. Mm-hmm. Uh, so 10 larynx pumps with the tongue in a relaxed, neutral position. So, mm-hmm. I can only see my screen really, really small, so I don't know if it's big enough. I don't know if, if you can see my throat moving. Yeah? Okay, good, cool. cool. You're on the big screen and I'm not. Oh, on the screen, no. So. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I don't want to be visible when I'm doing these things. <laughs> so, so the next step, we do our larynx pumps with the tongue neutral. The next step is to do our larynx pumps with the tongue stuck out. So, okay. Okay. Right? Yeah, exactly like that. Mm-hmm. And it's it's not... It's uh, sticking the tongue out doesn't mean anything. Mm-hmm. All we're doing is doing the same movement of the larynx uh-huh. with the tongue that we typically have a paired movement with mm-hmm. in different positions. So mm-hmm. we learn to separate right. the movement. Mm-hmm. Cool. So the next one, do you know what I mean? So it's not like the tongue sticking out has anything to do with anything. Yeah. You, can, you just need to do something different with the tongue. I see. So I do, we do 10 larynx pumps with the tongue out, and then the last one is 10 larynx pumps with the tongue folded over itself. Mm-hmm. And this is where you get the weird sounds beginning. Uh-huh. The weird choking, gagging sounds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the throat they tense up, right? But yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. Like this, the the lar- with the tongue folded over is the trickiest one. Um, <laughs> And it kind of like people will struggle to do it without choking, you know, like you, you hear everyone in the classroom like. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> and so, like I said, there's no reason to do necessarily the tongue folds over. I just think it's hilarious to watch a classroom of people uh, do it. So. <laughs> I can totally relate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's just. It's just a very, it's a different movement of the tongue, like significantly different than the previous one, so that we learn how to isolate just, just that larynx. Mm-hmm. So, so that's it for our larynx drill. So that's us uh, effectively learning how to control uh, the larynx uh, and, and, and move it independently of the tongue mm-hmm. so, that, uh, so that we can use it to move more air or more airflow, create like airflow up into the nasal cavity. Mm-hmm. Cool. So the next step, for, so that's something we do. You do uh, like, you know, you do your, your uh, 10, 10 uh, tongue neutral, 10 tongue out, 10 tongue folded over. Um, and the next thing I do is I get people to do uh, uh, Kapalabhati, the, the mm-hmm. yoga thing. Um, mm-hmm. And the reason I get people to do that is because Kapalabhati stimulates blood flow to the head. Mm-hmm. And effectively, the, uh, the, more, the more blood flow you have in your eustachian tubes, um, the more elastic they'll be for that moment. Okay. Like, you know, if you sit there, sit around and equalize mm-hmm. a lot, your ears are going to be fairly elastic, you know, for mm-hmm. the rest of the day or for a few hours. Yeah. Um, 
So we do a bunch of Kapalabhati and it move, it's basically just pummeling air out your nasal cavity really fast mm-hmm. and it stimulates a lot of blood flow to the head and it gets the ears feeling quite elastic because mm-hmm. with no hands, if the ears are elastic, then the, all the drills will be easier. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. So we usually do like, God, I mean, I don't really do two, like, I, I usually get people to do like, like three sets of 20 seconds of Kapalabhati. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. there, and there are some yogis out there that will laugh at me, but like, I, I do 20 seconds of Kapalabhati and I'm ready to fall over. So. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So, I mean, for, the, for those who don't know what Kapalabhati is, um, it, it is, uh, it's, it's basically like a, it's, it's called, it stands for fire breath or something like that in, in yoga. And it's just like a, a really strong, forceful exhale out of the nose and then a passive inhale. And you do it as fast as you get, as you are comfortable to do so. And it looks like this. So I'm doing a fast, short, aggressive exhale mm-hmm. and then relaxing and then the air just, you know, moves back in as I, as I inhale. But the inhale is passive, but it's really about that forceful exhale. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, now, so now we have uh, worked on our larynx isolation. We have sent some blood up to our head to warm up our eustachian tubes and get things moving. Then the next step is, is to work with the positioning of the soft palate. Now, here is when, you know, if I was teaching a workshop, I would just go through all of these different things. And I'm saying, okay, well, this will, will help you perhaps find the positioning. This will help you find the positioning. This will help you find the positioning. And then with the people, we will work, we see what works for, for individuals and say, well, that's, you know, incorporate that one to your daily, your daily routine or your daily program. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and they're really simple things. Like, for example, yawning. Mm-hmm. When we yawn, if you yawn now and you pay attention to what you're doing with your soft palate, you are moving into the position that pulls open the eustachian tube. I do. So, <laughs> so I get people to sit around and yawn for a little bit and pay attention to that feeling. <laughs> um, the other one is to actually to stick the tongue, sorry, to fold the tongue over itself and pull it back into the mouth like this. Because what we do when we do that is we tend to make space for the tongue mm-hmm. with the roof of the mouth and we lift the center of the soft palate up and that mm-hmm. also pulls pulls the soft palate into the correct position, the position that we are after. Yeah. Um, and we sit around and, we, you know, we play with these things. And, you know, if, if you're looking at learning, you know, how do you sit around and you play with these things and you, and you get a feel, you get a feel for how you're positioning your soft palate. Mm-hmm. And you can, you can look in the mirror when you're doing it too, you know, especially with the yawning exercise. You can look in the mirror mm-hmm. and yawn and see where things are moving because you'll see big movements um, mm-hmm. up in the roof of your mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, which then brings us to, I suppose, probably one of the most beneficial parts or one of the most important parts of the daily routine, which is the humming. Mm-hmm. So the humming is a really, a really cool thing because it basically it will let a person know, uh, A, whether you're doing it or B, whether you're not doing it. Because um, <laughs> like I said, uh, we don't have the ability now to, to look in the mirror and try to isolate muscles and see if it's working. And, mm-hmm. you know, so it's it, these are internal muscles that we can't really see. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what we have to do is we have to have some other kind of feedback, and the humming creates that feedback. Mm-hmm. Humming, uh, uh, basically, we, we, we place um, – uh, I like to get people to hum different letters because uh, – and, and once again, the letters are arbitrary. They don't – it's not like one letter is better than the other. It's just that we all move our mouths in different ways. And, mm-hmm. you know, if we hum A, it might work for you. And if we hum O, it might work for you. And if we hum E, it might work for you. Okay. And we just hum different letters and everyone finds the one that they, they feel the best with. Mm-hmm. Um, the most common one that tends to work for people is NG. Mm-hmm. You know, like, like the word, like at the end of the word sing, yeah. mm, that one. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so, for example, we would sit here and we, we hum hum the letter A, and then so this is the next part of the program, so everyone goes, all right, and uh, <laughs> and as they're humming, they're playing or they're moving their soft palate, trying to replicate the position that they mm-hmm. found perhaps before with the yawning or with the tongue, moving the tongue in like that, and they do, they do it until they can hear their hum resonating in their ears, mm-hmm. because if they can hear the humming resonating in their ears, mm-hmm. that means the station tubes are open, and the vibrations are moving straight 
you know, mm-hmm. well, uh, <laughs> they have a more direct route to the eardrum, mm-hmm. to the, you know, the, yeah, the inner ear. Um, so, uh, so when you hear the vibrations loudly vibrating in your ears, that's when the tubes are open. And when you can't, then the tubes are, are fairly closed. And most people would say, oh, I heard it for a bit, then it closes. And blah, blah, blah. it's just about mm-hmm. developing control. So I will often have people like hum, hum A for a while, hum mm-hmm. E, like all the vowels, mm-hmm. and then NG. Mm-hmm. And then I also like to throw in like a consonant or two, like D, because at, at that if we do D, we're putting the tongue in a similar position as a T frenzel. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But um, so yeah, the, uh, uh, so that's our, our humming phase. Mm-hmm. And then towards the end of the of the daily program, you just try to put it all together. I, I'm gonna plug my uh. I gotta plug my phone. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna change change spots. <laughs> um, yeah, they, then you just put it all all together, mm-hmm. and um, you. Uh, yeah, that works good. Uh, and, and you uh, position the soft palate as you uh, as, as you want to, as, as it's meant to be positioned, as you lift the larynx up. Mm-hmm. and create airflow and push a bit more air into the nasal cavity. Mm-hmm. And once again, the, the pushing the air up into the nasal cavity is not um, is not something that uh, we need to be doing, especially on a dive, mm-hmm. but I find it gives uh, someone who's learning a much higher success rate because, as, opposed, you know, as I was saying before, we're not waiting to time our equalization perfectly. Mm-hmm. We can just punch a bit of air up in there, <laughs> and then down the line we can learn to take that away. Yeah. Yeah, I think that especially I love the humming exercise because yeah. people can practice and they immediately totally. know if it works or if it doesn't. Usually they practice a dry and hope it's going to work and then they go. Yeah, they go, they go for a dive and they're like, oh, what happened? <laughs> totally, totally. And some people, they, they get to go deep diving like three or four times per summer. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They keep practicing and hoping and practicing, but... Yep. The humming exercise, they get the feedback immediately. So I really love that. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And it's all about awareness, I guess, from what you're saying. Yeah. First find out what you're doing and then isolate the movements and the muscles. Exactly. I do find that, that some if, if we're in a rush to skip be, skip past the isolation phase, mm-hmm. by the time a person is like, you know, really learning to put it all together at the end, mm-hmm. Uh, they 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 have much uh, less problem solving capacity mm-hmm. um, because like oh well you could this be going wrong could that be going wrong or could that be going wrong whereas if we are isolating these muscles properly and we we know how to move them mm-hmm. uh, at least we know we can rule all these things out and just say okay well I didn't find the correct position of my soft palate today mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah that's cool um how how much time do you recommend to find that out I mean we've gone that through that really quickly. But yeah, would you say what would be a good time frame to go through these exercises? I think yeah, about fifteen minutes per day would be would be the best thing to do, and um, and you practice these exercises every day until mm-hmm. you get it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like I said, that that might take you one day, it might mm-hmm. take you one week, or it mm-hmm. might take you a month or two months, but you know, usually it's not much longer than that. <laughs> Yeah, but it's worth it. And I think if somebody really it's wants so to, worth it. Then they'll find the 15 minutes per day. <laughs> exactly. And you can do it while you're doing anything else. I mean, you could even, you could probably even do it in an office as long as people didn't mind you humming every now and again. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, I, I think that um, like, like hands free equalizing is amazing. It's, it's one of the best skills to learn in free diving. So mm-hmm. I, th- I think it's totally worth it. Mm, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Great. Thank you. <laughs> Um, does anybody have any questions? Please put them in the chat so we can answer them now. Natalie says, so funny, my family thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can totally understand that. <laughs> okay, no further questions. That sounds good. Well, that was really <laughs> helpful. And um, I think it, it helps. Uh, it takes a lot of pressure, of pressure out of the free diving <laughs> for many people. Yes, totally. When I came across your video about the hands-free equalization, I also learned about your Patreon project. <laughs> oh, yes. And I found that really, I found that amazing. And um, the first thing was, yeah, I want to support that. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your freediving family project and about your deep weeks and what you're all up to. So, um 
but okay, so the, the, the freediving, uh, oh, we actually really quick, we have a question from Natalie, ah. which was um, something about, would, do you actually, would you mind reading up? Because I, I, it's, it's yeah. faster to navigate on the computer, I imagine, than on a phone. Um, um, I have a question. Do I have to do all together, all the different exercises? Uh, so you do it, we do it one by one. So you first start with the larynx control. So 10 pumps, tongue neutral, 10 pumps, tongue out, 10 pumps, fold it over. Then we move to the uh, Kapalabhati to warm up the ears. Then we move to the um, soft palate uh, awareness or isolation exercises, which mm -hmm. are the humming. Sorry, the fir first like some yawning maybe, and then some just trying to feel it out. And then we move to humming. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we move to putting it all together at the end and, and, mm -hmm. and seeing if we can make it work. Cool. Thank you. Natalie says, um, oh, okay, great. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, about the, pa the Patreon thing was um, – was a was a fun project so basically uh you know i, I started making um okay so okay, I, I may, i'll go i'll go back in time a little bit <laughs> when when i first got into free diving um it was impossible to find information mm -hmm. uh if you didn't train with an instructor or then then that was it you didn't know and then what happened when you became uh better than your instructor what happened when you in, just in terms of your performance right what happens when you're diving deeper than your instructor when your instructor doesn't know the, what it's like to be as deep as you are and answer the questions you might mm -hmm. have okay so then you go somewhere and you pay someone else to train you someone die deeper than you and then that that process just continues on until you're an athlete and then you're you know trying to work things out yourself or talking mm -hmm. to your, your fellow athletes and and so that's that's the process i went through and to be honest with you like uh, it was a really slow process over the years of slowly picking up information and, and being able to apply it. And obviously the people that came before me, it would, it would have been even slower, you know, and, and they were pioneering it as they were going along. So um, I just kind of felt that uh, there was also this mentality at the time of, um, oh, you know, like a, a freediving instructor's information is their like way they make a living and so because people would always send you messages like hey you know can you give me some tips about free diving and then the the general uh feeling amongst instructors was like no like you can pay me mm -hmm. <laughs> and um and i didn't necessarily agree with that because uh, i just thought it was impossible how is everyone like a not everyone can afford a free diving course and b not everyone lives near a free diving instructor and this was also now now everyone lives near a free diving instructor <laughs> but maybe you know five five or ten years ago they didn't yeah so I started making some like basic YouTube uh, tutorial videos and obviously people liked them and it was the first I, I suppose I was the first person to start doing that and so they were the first of their kind um, and then I thought oh well you know this is really cool but like uh, uh, it's, uh, so also the other thing is is that um, a, a, about 60% of the people because uh, I was also playing around on other social media at the time right like on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and all that and about 60 or so percent of the people that followed me were from third world countries mm -hmm. who were just under no circumstances going to be able to afford a course with me or just about anyone else mm -hmm. um, and so I thought okay well here I can make why don't I put together effectively a um uh like a, a complete digital free diving manual that I can give people access to really really cheaply because uh now I mean now I also sell it but um uh, like in the beginning as well like it was it was all you know people got access to it for you know two five or seven dollars a month however much they were willing to to donate or pledge to the project um and, uh, I, you know, and with the money of which I, I used to make the manuals because I was kind of like, because because there were a lot of work. So I wasn't able to teach free diving at the time. So I was like, well, I need to make enough money to, to like cover my bases. So that's what I, I sort of, you know, I, shift, I shifted it over. Mm -hmm. and, and now it's a really cool thing where there are like 400 odd people that support the project and we're still making manuals. And um, not only am I putting my own manuals up there, but I'm getting some of the world's best freedivers to make manuals for it as well and give people access to that. Um, so it's really just about information. It's, it's, it's really about the same thing as I've always been about, which is information sharing, mm -hmm. except it's set up in a way that um, uh, like people donate towards it because 
the time it takes me to do it is time I can't spend like teaching a course on the weekend. Mm -hmm. So it just supplements my, my living expenses like that. Mm -hmm. um, so like now we have, we have Dean Xiao, who has made a, um, who's the British uh, no fins record holder. who's made a no fins uh, masterclass and he's made a bi fins masterclass and mm -hmm. Thibaut Guinea, the French champion is, mm -hmm. is making a free immersion masterclass and a mental training masterclass. You know what I mean? So it's I think it's really, really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's amazing. And it was at the time, I think um, I came across in 2018, mm -hmm. there was nothing like it. And I really like the idea. Yeah. Of, it's not, hey, you have to buy a course to get access to the knowledge, but especially for people to get into it and to decide then if they want to learn it or if it is their thing or also to, totally. um, to refresh the knowledge because there's so much information we share in the freediving courses and um, in such a short amount of time and so yeah on. oh yeah well you know the really interesting thing with the, the the i suppose like the concept of of, of giving away free information or, or information sharing mm -hmm. or giving away cheap information is that um i think a lot of instructors especially when i first began because I, i don't know if you know this but when i made my first youtube tutorial i got so much hate for it <laughs> From freediving instructors, no, mm -hmm. you know what I mean. They're so, oh yeah, because they were, they were like, hey, "What are you doing? You're giving away mm -hmm. this information for free." Mm -hmm. And my argument was that I don't think that's the. I think that giving away the information or giving away, I mean, because you, you can't teach a comprehensive mm -hmm. course on YouTube. <laughs> so I thought giving away enough or bits or a part of the information enough that I felt would make people safe would also make them interested to keep learning. And that's, that's what happened. We had like, we had so many more people signing up for freediving courses. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been a trend as, as more and more people make their own tutorials. Now there's so many people making freediving blogs and freediving vlogs and freediving tutorials and just putting information out there. And it, all it does is fuel the freediving industry. And it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's <laughs> cool. I think it's, It's a lot about building trust. And if they like what you're doing and if they trust you, they will come totally. to anyway. It's not about Ab yeah. taking somebody else's business or whatever. So Absolutely. Absolutely. That amazing support. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a bumpy road in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you did it. <laughs> <laughs> so I can share information for free now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's <laughs> totally cool. But you also initiated your deep weeks. Oh yeah. Um Tell us a little bit more about that. What you're doing, why you're doing it, and what people you are trying to to get um into those courses. So um Deep Week kind of started in a similar kind of uh vein as as uh, the manuals in, in the sense that like um, so, so I started teaching some training camps because, uh, what would happen is, is, um, I would get usually, um, uh, like the, the freediving competition season would run over the Australian winter. And so like, for example, I would come home from vertical blue, which would be in the middle of the Australian winter and no one would want to learn how to freedive or very few people want to learn how to freedive. And I was like, well, I, I'm broke after flying to the Bahamas for the last two months. <laughs> so, so I need to, um, And he makes some money. So I started running training camps in Bali um, afterwards. And then it turned in, they, they just grew. They just grew. And they, there was this really, you know, you know, I mean, you know, it's like when you take a group of freedivers overseas somewhere, like it's just like, it's just good people having good times. And it was just, there was so, it was so fantastic. And, and then I got to the point where I was, I, I felt like I really wanted to start bringing other people into it. So I was like, you know, um, the first person who I brought in was Alexi. And I said, Hey, Alexi, like, How much it, how much is it going to cost me <laughs> to have you come mm -hmm. and teach for a week? And he was like, quoted me this price. And I was like, Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> so, so the only way I was able to, um, to make it happen was to try to get as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. And so then they became really big. And so the one with Alexi, we had 60 people turn up. Oh. Um, Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Uh, and, and you know, so w when it was me on my own, the biggest one we had, we had 38. Wow. And I was like, wow, like this is a huge, I, was, I thought, I, I thought it was a monster. And then Alexi came and it was like, boom, 60. And then, <laughs> and then that, that's what started happening. I just, every, every new deep week, I, well, I basically, Uh, brought like you know other other uh, you know world champions or high level freedivers in, and uh, and and used 
effectively used the large volume of students to cover the huge expense of having the world champions and then having the the 30 to 50 assistant instructors that we need to also make it run and the venue and you know what I mean but um uh so I, I think that uh, in the in the beginning, because also in the beginning, it, a deep league was half the price it is now. So mm -hmm. it used to, it used to be four hundred and ninety dollars for a week Australian dollars, mm -hmm. which is three hundred US. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, for me, as a, well, I was I was like twenty two, twenty three years old. I was like, you know what I mean? I didn't. I was a I was a young freediver and freediving instructor who was accustomed to having absolutely no money. Mm -hmm. And so if I could like make a few thousand dollars in a week, like I was just over the moon. Mm -hmm. Um and then obviously as we brought in like people like Alexi and 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 God who we've had and Goran and, and William and we well we didn't we had Guillaume coming this year but then that all we um uh then we had to put the price up because <laughs> But originally, originally it was all about making making training with these people um, as accessible as possible. Mm -hmm. And when we put the price up, eventually it became not accessible to a lot of people in Southeast Asia. So then we mm -hmm. we started doing the Deep Week Scholarship, which was you know offering free spots to locals and offering free instructor courses to locals, so we could try to. Because uh, I've always felt really bad, or really, I felt I've actually always felt really uncomfortable about the fact that uh, in a lot of uh, a lot of uh, like Southeast Asia, the freediving industry is controlled by foreigners, mm -hmm. um, charging foreign prices for foreign services. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've always tried to get as many locals to become as instructors as possible, and that, that's not just been me. That's always there's been so many people who have been a part of that or trying to make that happen. And, and now, now there are now, especially like in countries like the Philippines and Indonesia, there are so many uh, local freediving instructors. There's entire you know local freediving communities, and it's fantastic. You know, like, yeah. But yeah, no, I mean now, and then I think as I, I, it went on, and then it, it turned into. I suppose less because they used to be like more like work. Uh, they used to be more like training camps, mm -hmm. and then they because they became bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and I suppose the bigger they became, the larger our budget became. So we could afford to include more things. We could, you know, like um, uh, you know, at the last uh, deep week, we had William Trubridge and Vitamin Marchik, and we had several other like really high profile people mm -hmm. teaching all at once. And so I suppose like to me, like it became more like a festival. Yeah, you know how like. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because you know how in a festival it's like they have stages everywhere. Like, oh, you know, go over here and hear that person playing. Go over here and hear that person playing. And I was like, well, we're doing the same thing. You know, we've got we have three workshops. We so six workshops every day, three all running at the same time in two different mm -hmm. workshop slots. And you, there are three different people speaking about three different topics. And you just go to whichever one you want. That's every goddamn day. <laughs> so it's really, it's really, uh, yeah, it's like a festival. <laughs> Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. With, um, do you have any upcoming deep weeks or did you have to cancel everything? <laughs> we cancelled everything. Uh, well, I could actually scratch that, scratch that. Uh, deep week Croatia is mm -hmm. still going to be viable, I think. Okay. Um, I, I won't be able to get there, but Goran is going to run it. So mm -hmm. we have, uh, yeah, we have quite a few people booked for that one. I think that probably r realistically about half the people we have booked won't go or won't be able to go. Mm -hmm. But I think that there sh by by the end of August, start of September, there should be enough uh, travel like domestically around Europe that the Europeans will be able to go because it's almost exclusively Europeans that have booked onto it. So, mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's happening. And then we've, we're going to aim to do another one in November in Bali, but mm -hmm. I haven't, I haven't like pulled the trigger on like announcing it yet. Do you know what I mean? Because I just don't want to jump the gun. Yeah, keep the fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and you know like <laughs> the worst, I, you know, the worst thing is like uh, you know uh, planning an event, announcing it, mm -hmm. starting to accept deposits and payments from people, and then in a few months' time saying, "Hey, sorry guys," and every, and everyone misses out. Everyone, mm -hmm. you know, they buy flights, they 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 organize their leave from work. All that kind of jazz. So I'm not. I'm not going to announce another one until I'm absolutely certain that it will it will run. Yeah, I can totally understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't want to do it again. Yeah. Um. Wonderful. Um. One more topic I have is talking about the Mohyanov system. Yeah. Yeah. It's 
It's been out for, I think, two years, but in Europe, mm -hmm. there's not too much information available. So maybe oh, okay. you can tell us a little bit more about what the philosophy is. Is it really about uh, creating athletes and meters and minutes, or is it <laughs> what people is it? Why why is there another system? And yeah, what what's totally. your why? <laughs> Why? All right, I tell you, I tell you exactly why. So, uh, about a little over two years ago, it's about three years ago, um, I I was a uh, I was working with Paddy, and uh, I was uh, one of the five first instructor trainers that Paddy effectively launched their program with, and the, and their program was full of holes, as you may well be aware. Do you do you, do you teach Paddy? <laughs> I'm the instructor trainer. <laughs> I mean, so am I, you know, <laughs> still. I mean, technically, I haven't given up my status. Um, uh, but there were many things about it that I didn't like. Mm -hmm. And I, I would bring it up with, um, with the, I, I brought it up with the CEO of Paddy once, and I brought it up with the regional managers of Paddy the, for Asia Pacific. Mm -hmm. And and I would always get the answer like, oh, yeah, you know, like, it's just, it's all new. Like, we're going to review the system, la di da di da di da mm -hmm. And then eventually, like, years later, Uh, I realized and was basically told like, Hey, no, we're not ever going to change mm -hmm. these things that you keep telling us are huge mm -hmm. flaws. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I decided to, to leave. And at this time, uh, at this time, really there was like, um, I suppose internationally there was ADA, there was SSI and then there was Paddy. Wow. And, and it, it really, it really bothered me that, that the scuba diving agencies were going to do their very best to take over or to dominate the free diving industry. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, uh, I knew that Alexei had the Molchanov system in Russia and I, you know, I'd spoken to him several times about, hey, why don't we make this thing worldwide? Why don't we launch it? Why don't we, you know, turn it into something international? And he was always, in the very beginning, he was always a little bit hesitant because, um, you know, it's a huge, like, you know, it's his baby, right? It's something that he, his mum originally came up with. And here I was like, hey, Alexi, give me the reins of this thing. Let me, like, <laughs> you know, so he was understandably hesitant in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we got some other people involved, like the current CEO, Chris Kim, and then, um, and then it started, the ball started to, to move a little bit faster, um, and, and things, and, and, uh, we were like, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to, we're going to create a new system. Um, and so in many ways, this, the system was, there were several different reasons for it. So, um, uh, for, for Alexi, it was a way in which, Uh, I suppose he could uh, continue his mum's legacy. It was a way in which he, he, because you know, he also felt like he, he also didn't look too highly on a lot of the, the other freediving agencies and what mm -hmm. they were teaching. So it was a way that he could improve that. Mm -hmm. For me, it was a way we could also, you know, improve the quality of freediving education and create something that um, would pull freedivers together, so that that we didn't lose freediving to the uh, terrible money-making machines that are the scuba diving agencies, in my opinion, mm -hmm. at least. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so, and so, and, and that, that was actually one of, you know, it was one of the, and, and also, you know, it, it wasn't, it's, but it's, it's becoming easier now, but it wasn't easy to make a living as a free diving instructor. And so we were wanting to make it as easy as possible. Um, and this is like one of the reasons why, you know, for Moltenov instructors, there are no certification fees. Mm -hmm. You know, you pay like a, like a, like a, a like a re annual renewal fee, which is larger than other agencies, but mm -hmm. it's like, uh, for someone, if, if you're teaching like, you know, like a, if you're making a living as a freediving instructor, mm -hmm. you're saving usually tens of thousands of dollars in fees you'd be paying to the agencies for the privilege to certify. Yeah. So. We wanted to get rid of all the road bumps and it wasn't about making money. And the thing was, is that Alexi also was selling gear. So we're like, okay, fantastic. We can, we can sell gear mm -hmm. and use the money to make education like, you know, more accessible, better and allow our instructors to make more money out of it. So, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, uh, there, there was a lot of, there was a, there was a lot of things involved in why we built Nolt Snobs, but all of them really came out of like, like a bunch of really <laughs> young people's idealistic <laughs> views about what free dive, what the world of free diving should be mm -hmm. and um, trying to preserve what we loved about it, you know, which was, which was why we've had so much emphasis on community building and mm -hmm. which is why we, we started base training, which is like, mm -hmm. you know, um, 
training program that all our instructors and students get access to free of charge every week, <laughs> you know, that we can all train around the world together. You know what I mean? It was, it was all about preserving what we all loved about freediving because we, I felt in particular, I felt this impending doom of, um, of, of losing freediving, of losing the freediving industry to, to big business. Right. Um, so yeah, that, at least that was, those were my motivations. I mean, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, maybe Alexi will have other things to say. Yeah, we'll oh, I, I, yeah, yeah, I put some words in his mouth, but you know, I'm sure he'll say, I'm sure he'll say something yeah. similar. <laughs> yeah, a, a totally um, a new assistant because the missing link so far was how get people or how keep people involved after courses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when I did my freediving education, like 10, 15, you know, 10, um, 11 years ago, then it was, okay, I want to learn freediving, then I take a course. And if I want to learn yeah. more, then I have to sign up for the next course, even though I'm not sure I will pass that because, you exactly. know, <laughs> but the, and, the, the, and, the, you see. Yeah, and, 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 and like en an endless stream of courses isn't necessarily mm -hmm. the best way for people to learn, you know, mm -hmm. like, It's all about it's all about experience and diving and training and you know just doing it you know and and then you know when you want a period of intense progression uh, mm -hmm. you take the next course mm -hmm. but um, yeah <laughs> I think I think to be honest we have accomplished what we want to achieve with the system mm -hmm. and I think that you know and you know actually what's, what's really interesting the truth was at the time when we were sitting around the table talking about this we raised the question like hey why don't we all just get behind Ada. Mm -hmm. Why don't we just support ADA? Because ADA is a magnificent organization. Mm -hmm. But the, the the reality of ADA as an organization is it is that it's it's an organization of of volunteers, mm -hmm. um, and it's a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And and unfortunately, like we 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 felt that a like we need to make a profit to keep keep things going. Because for example, like you know, if we want to make a new program, we can employ people turn and turn around in a few weeks to a month and hit bang, here's a new program. Or we need to change things We, we because ADA suffers from a, a severe lack of manpower and lack of finance. Mm -hmm. And so ADA is kind of like a bull without horns. It can't really accomplish much. So otherwise I would have been all for getting behind ADA. Mm -hmm. I personally would have been all for turning ADA into a commercial organization mm -hmm. so it could better service the world of freediving. But that's not what was, that would never happen. <laughs> Especially if it takes um, such a long time to get things going and approved and yes. ask everybody and get the feedback. Yes. It's a real pity. I've yeah. been working with Oli Christen on the four-star uh, manuals and mm -hmm. we were ready, but it still took ages to For get sure. approved and designed it, and get them out. <laughs> It's like you go. It's like going through a government. You know, it's going to be approved by different tiers and then sent back. And if it gets sent back, it goes to this person. That you <laughs> and the, with freediving, it's there's still so much to learn, and there's so many uh, new insights that are coming up. So um, all the time, it's really important that things get into the education system really quickly. It's like with um, yeah. with the epiglottis. You know, you have to close the epiglottis yeah. <laughs> um, to do um, um, equalization. <laughs> it was a um, translation error or something but now yeah. the whole freediving world believed that it's the epiglottis but it's actually not so i really like I, that I, I, and our system that it's so you're so fast totally totally well you, ha you, ha you have to be reactive don't you mm -hmm. i think we, we had a we had a, a meeting last night about like hey like how how do we change our education system mm -hmm. to uh to respond to covid Mm -hmm. um and and basically in the space of one meeting uh we've got a complete plan to make totally new programs which will be ready ideally in like a few weeks um so that we can like deal with the current situation which i suppose mm -hmm. like uh like well i mean like you know I, 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 don't, i don't i don't necessarily want to talk negatively about other agencies because i think every agency has its place i <laughs> i will only say negative things about <laughs> some scuba diving agencies because I don't believe their heart their hearts are in the right place but um but yeah I think Ada Ada like isn't able to do that just because they don't have the manpower because mm -hmm. it's a volunteer organization which is a shame I think I believe if Ada were a commercial organization or like you know 
I don't know, like, like operated slightly more commercially, even if they were a nonprofit, they saw, you know, had people on salary and things like that. We could have a much more, uh, I don't know, I suppose diverse and uh, engaged and bigger, better freediving world. Right. So I'm really curious about <laughs> what the freediving world will be in two or three years. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot moving, I think, at the moment. So it's yeah, yeah. Yeah, going to be interesting. I think the, the freedom will, will be big in a few years. I hope so. Like big, big. <laughs> yeah. Let's we're, gonna be, we're, 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 we're gonna be in big trouble. We're gonna like we're, we're not gonna want to hit us, you know. <laughs> yeah, that would be really cool. Let's see <laughs> more questions. Does anybody have another question? Corin had a question. She's on the call today. She asked me another day, um, and I gave mm -hmm. her feedback, but maybe you have something more. It's about the yeah. uh, contractions on dynamics. Like she said that the oh. contractions on dynamics are really strong. They're really tough, and it's really difficult for her to yeah. keep going. So my question is, is how, how far do you swim after the contractions begin? Maybe Corinne can comment on that. Oh, is she here? She's here, yeah. Oh, yeah, cool. Okay, so, so Corinne, how, 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 how far are we talking about? Do you know what I mean? Like, are we talking about doing some huge dynamics or, or is it, uh, or is you, you're just feeling uncomfortable with, with the general sensation? Let's see if she's coming on because I did not um, tell her before. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll answer generally then. Um, so, you know, actually, you, you, you mentioned earlier about the, the Maltinov system. Like, is it all about minutes and meters and athletes? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and my answer to that would be, like, absolutely not. Um, because we, we, we effectively use what we are calling the gentle freedive philosophy, mm -hmm. um, which is that it's all about sensations. It's all mm -hmm. about feelings. It's all about pleasant feelings. Because um, it's, like, and anyone anyone if they're willing oh here we go we have the question <laughs> it's just by dynamic by static uh oh. do you wanna, I, I i just can't dynamic, find the actual uh, chat when it, yeah by dynamics by static or deep i manage contractions quite well okay so it's just just dynamic mm -hmm. yeah so in, in in general the contractions or the urge to breathe that you have during dynamic i also find to be the worst i find mm -hmm. it worse than static i find it worse than depth um And the, the, the trick is, is that, so there, there are two types of, um, CO2 drills that you can do. Mm -hmm. There are, there are drills that get you, uh, accustomed to the feeling. Oh, yes. Yeah, I'll write it in. I'll, I'll read that. I'll write it in Not German now. Maybe that helps. I was going to try to read it out. You know? <laughs> So we have two different kinds of exercises. We have exercises that get a person comfortable with the urge to breathe and contractions. And we have exercises that increase the period of time a person can hold their breath for before they get the urge to breathe. Mm -hmm. Now, most um, after 30 meters. Okay, cool. So m most of the, the CO2 workouts that I see people doing are not necessarily targeted. Mm -hmm. targeted to, to those things so for example one of the things that you can do um that will, will increase your uh your feeling of discomfort with with the oyster breathing contractions for dynamic is a lot of hypercapnic swimming so mm -hmm. it's very simple it's just you just swim and you just restrict the amount of breaths that you take so mm -hmm. you know you can breathe it depends on your swimming level and your co2 levels you can breathe once every um once every four strokes or once every six or once every once every eight you just find like a number that that you can sustain that you feel comfortable with mm -hmm. and and you do it for a long time that's the other thing is volume is very important a uh, high high volume so for example I, 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 um let's say we take like a classic co2 table where we like all right cool we have two minutes to breathe And we do eight swims of 50 meters and every swim we're going to take away 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a great drill, except for the fact that it's over really fast and you only trained towards the end. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas something simple, something super simple, like hypercapnic swimming, you, you are staying under a high load of carbon dioxide for oh, 10, 20, 30 minutes at a time. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it makes a large adaptation in the body. Um, but but in, ge in general, I, d I don't believe that a person should be swimming to the point of discomfort ever. 
Mm-hmm. So uh, if if we are swimming, like in freediving, we we make progression by going to the very edge of the comfort zone, but not outside the comfort zone. Because if we go outside the comfort zone, we ha- we leave like negative impressions in the mind that we associate with breath holds. And and you know we're talking about the part of our brain that wants to breathe. Like I promise you, it's stronger than your conscious mind is. Like if if it, if it wants to make you go up, it'll make you go up. Mm-hmm. If it wants to make you feel bad, it'll make you feel bad. Mm-hmm. So the the way that we get around this is by ju- like literally just having a great time. So and I, I don't mean that we can never have the urge to breathe, but if you're genuinely happy with the urge to breathe, or if the, if those if the contractions that you're having at that level are totally comfortable, you keep going. The mm-hmm. second they're not comfortable, like that's the limit. That's that's when you come up, or you ideally come up before then. Um, so my my advice would be to perhaps change the way that you're training mm-hmm. so that you're not you're not actually having that. Uh, you're not actually experiencing contractions that make you feel bad so that you train, you have contractions that you don't mind having. And so you can do a combination of either just shortening your swims mm-hmm. or, and, and hy- I think hypercapnic swimming in this instance will, will be quite helpful. Okay, great. Thank you. So you would say you do not have to suffer to become a better free diver. <laughs> you do not have to suffer to become a better free diver. 100%. 100%. That's great news. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. <laughs> Well, great. Thank you. Does anybody have have another question or anything else to ask before we wrap it up? No, doesn't look like this. Cool. Well, Fantastic. Thank you very much, Adam. I really appreciate it. It was a great talking to you. Ah, pleasure. That was great. I, I, I'm going to go dig some holes in my garden now and plant some trees. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. that's what I was doing. You know, I, I was I was uh, when when I realized it was close to time. I was like, oh my god, I was covered in dirt. I was in the garden. I was like, oh, I gotta have a quick shower. And <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great mission, planting trees, <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you. I hope we get back into the water real quickly, and hope to yeah, get me too. Into the water with you one day. <laughs> Thank you so so much. I'm sure we'll see each other very soon. Yeah, that would be great. Bye. Thank you. Bye. See you later. <laughs>